Welcome to the first Mies podcast brought to you from London, where I'm joined by managing editor James Cocaine and senior editor Jamie Ingram. I'm Kate Durian, and I'm contributing editor um, by Write Weekly Insights, highlighting the main stories that are covered in our weekly publication. So let me introduce you briefly to Mies. Um, it's a subscription-only weekly that was established in 1957 published every Friday in electronic format and a hard copy that's sent to subscribers around the world. MIS, formerly known as the Middle East Economic Survey, covers a wide range of topics relating to energy, the economy and geopolitics in the Middle East and North Africa. Our reporting and analysis by award-winning journalists is backed by proprietary data from our extensive archives dating back to our inception that James deftly transforms into useful charts and graphs. Dr. Saleh Jalad is owner and publisher of Mies, and we're grateful for the guidance and support that he provides to our small team of reporters and editors. So let me now turn to the main stories that were included in our last edition and look ahead to where we see the most important developments in the MENA region and beyond. Let me turn first to Jamie, who uh, covers the Gulf region, and ask him about a subject that's very topical at the moment, and that is the risk of an energy crisis in the event of a Russian invasion of Ukraine, and what role Qatar, as the world's second largest exporter of LNG, can play in assuring global energy security. So, Jamie, can Qatar ride to the rescue, and how is it placed to do so if there's an interruption to gas supplies to Europe from Russia? Thanks, Kate. Uh, well, as you say, Qatar you know, is certainly a very topical issue at the moment. The visit of the Emir to the US last week, where he met um, with President Joe Biden, captured headlines around the world. Um, in, in the Western economies and in Europe in particular, there's growing concerns over an existing gas crunch um, that could be exacerbated by the situation in Ukraine if uh, anything threatens Russian gas flows. So with Qatar coming to, to the US, the big question was, will they be able to help the situation here? The first question that came to my mind was, is this political theatre or can Qatar really help? Um, as you say, they're the second largest producer or an exporter of LNG. They fell behind Australia in 2020. Now, Qatar is a very centralised um, p political decision-making um, country. Um, if they, so it's much easier for cargoes to be diverted if there is political will than somewhere like Australia where it's in the hands of private companies. Um, ultimately, the easiest way t for any country to increase exports to Europe is to increase the overall exports. Is that possible? Unfortunately not. Like any rational actor, Qatar has been pumping as much LNG as they physically could over the last um, four to six months, certainly, to capitalise on the high prices. So their production capacity is 77 million tonnes. That's what they've been producing. In fact, often they're, they're able to squeeze out a little bit more than that. So. So then the second option is to redirect cargoes from their key buyers in Asia over into Europe. Again, is, that, is it possible for, for that to happen? Well, I think that what we have to do is look at the words last week of the Minister of Energy for Qatar. He said that Qatar stands ready to support our partners around the world in times of need. So that's surely a good sign, you know, Qatar wants to help out Europe. But he then added his pride that Qatar has never missed a single cargo delivery for the last 25 years and also that uh, keeping our contractual word is sacrosanct in Qatar. So so clearly they need the buy-in of, of their existing clients. They're not simply going to turn around and say, we know that you want LNG, but we're sending it to, to Europe. Tough luck. But, uh, I mean, the visit in, uh, to the United States is, 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 is interesting and, uh, and obviously there's coordination also with Europe. But mm -hmm. doesn't Qatar also have capacity in the United States itself um, so that it can actually export from U.S. LNG terminals to Europe and elsewhere in well, the future? That's, uh, as you say, that's something for the future. Um, they are certainly investing heavily in the uh, Golden Pass LNG facility, but that's not online yet. So that's... Um, Qatar, Qatar is investing heavily not just in the US but also in Qatar to expand their capacity. Um, that's something that certainly will be excellent down the road. Um, they're planning to hit 110 million tonnes a year and then 126 million tonnes a year in Qatar alone. But unfortunately that's not going to help the current situation. If I'm looking for a positive um, spin for this basically, 
I would say that the high prices have, we have seen instances of fuel switching in Asia. So basically this is in China, say, um, the, the high prices of LNG and gas have forced them to make the economic decision to burn more coal instead. So that theoretically does free up volumes. We're also, I think, as James can say, entering a bit of a, a relatively lower demand period in China and Asia, so that could free up more volumes for Europe as well. They're talking about switching, I'll, I'll go briefly to one, one place where we have seen a switch from coal to, from coal to gas, uh, and that's Dubai, which mm-hmm. uh, was <laughs> touting clean coal yeah, yeah. Um, power plants, and now I think with their higher um, net zero targets, they've, uh, they've decided to switch yeah, definitely the net zero uh, ambitions play a key role in that. I think also them that they're going to be hosting the COP discussions in a year or two as well. Uh, so it goes Egypt and then and then the UAE. I think it was going to be a bit embarrassing having the own. I think it's the Middle East's only coal fired power plant. Um, so a little bit of uh, political need to change that. It was interesting though that even though they were ditching it clearly for environmental reasons, they kept insisting that it was a clean coal plant. <laughs> Um, so let's, uh, we will stay a little bit with the gas market, but, but it's not just in the gas market where we see tightness. It's also reflected in the oil market. And we've seen prices rise above 90 per barrel, which is a seven year high, um, on mainly on worries about supply with a mix of geopolitics thrown in. So this may be partly a legacy of investment declines that we've seen during previous price downturns and not entirely by the energy transition. Um, but producers are struggling um, to meet higher production quotas. Our last report on OPEC production, for example, shows that the 10 producers within OPEC who are subject to cuts were entitled to increase production by more than 250,000 barrels per day in January, but managed only 180,000 between them. And there are other producers. I mean, I think the main ones are um, Angola and Nigeria, but there are other producers that risk falling behind, both within OPEC and, and the wider um, OPEC plus group, which is led by Russia. So um, as these production cuts by OPEC plus are being unwound um, towards the end of the year, there are certain countries where um, lack of investment in upstream, poor governance, for example, Algeria. Um, we we had a report on this. and. Um, James, you follow developments in Algeria, even though you didn't actually write the piece, but you follow North African developments. And the the question that we asked was whether Algeria can actually produce more than a million barrels per day once the OPEC OPEC plus fully unwinds its cuts by by September, as is the plan. Yes, um, thanks, Kate. Yeah. So in the two years that the current, or almost two years that the current OPEC plus output agreements in effect, um, what you've seen, obviously, in 2020 was most countries slashed capex. And whilst some countries, in particular Saudi Arabia and the UAE and outside of uh, OPEC plus Qatar as well, have been able to um, ramp up capex, they've got plentiful reserves, they've been able to ramp up capex in recent months and have big plans to increase it going forward. Other countries, such as Algeria, which already had very stretched finances, so um, investment slashed in 2020 and really haven't been able to pick up the pace since. I mean, we'll see going forward, obviously their revenues are looking better now than they were a year ago, but, uh, but as of now, investment slow. And also in a lot of ways, Algeria in, in trying to attract investment, they're um, fighting the last war, as it were. Everyone else is talking about the energy transition and hydrogen and renewables, and Algeria is still trying to reform its oil and gas law and get more regular upstream investment from IOCs. Now, they have a new oil and gas law that was um, passed a few months ago, but so far they've only got one new agreement under this, and this is with um, ENI, and so far even that's pretty vague. And you have to say, I mean, as you know, Kate, with any, they, they're very big on um, government relations. You know, their CEO, uh, Claudio Descalzi, he likes going to different capitals and, and signing agreements. But frankly speaking, if you look at their earnings calls or their results, they never even mention Algeria. It's not like it's a priority uh, um, for them. So, yeah, Al- Algeria, when the um, OPEC cuts first came into effect, they had a baseline of um, 
1.06 million barrels a day. So our piece, which is written by our North Africa editor, Aidan Chalak, in the latest issue, our piece looked at whether they can get anywhere near this uh, baseline. And our, our conclusion is that they'll struggle to produce a million barrels a day. So to give you an idea, um, already for January, um, their production has risen. So to date, they've managed to keep up with their increment. It's not like um, Angola or Nigeria who are miles behind and it's just a fiction. So far, Algeria has been able to increase output, but the production for January at 970,000 barrels a day, we think that's getting pretty close to the maximum they can produce. Um, this latest piece, we looked at how much Sonatrack and its IOC partners had invested. And for 2020, which is the last um, com last um, complete figures, they um, they invested 5.1 billion upstream, and of which of that only 1 billion was IOCs. Both of those figures are the lowest in well over a decade, but particularly the IOC share has fallen by more. And one reason that's important is that, frankly speaking, Sonatrack is not very commercially minded with its upstream spending. It seems like the um, the department that fo focuses on exploration and the department that focuses on actually making money or commercializing fines don't talk to each other. They'll quite happily spend most of the exploration budget on drilling wells in areas of the country that have uh, nowhere near infrastructure and have little chance of being developed anytime soon. I mean, what you'll see actually when Algeria has um, makes awards to IOCs or has bid rounds, it's to develop fines that were made in the 70s or the 80s. So they need to up their game with um, attracting investments. And they're trying. I mean, the, the current head of Sonatrack talks quite a good game. But like I say, it's, it's very much um, fighting the last war. It's, it's, it's nothing to do with renewables or with hydrogen. It's all about can we find IOCs to invest in developing previous upstream uh, fines. So I think Algeria's got an uphill task to um, raise uh, output capacity. And I think you have to say the default would be that it's going to fall rather than rise going forward. And of course, Algeria is also a major supplier of gas to, mm -hmm. to Europe uh, via pipeline. And they also export LNG also, although that's, that um, is not at the, the same volumes of, as in the past. Um, but it's not only Algeria and North Africa where we see supply shortfalls. In fact, or elsewhere in the Middle East region, we have uh, problems. Libya has been up and down because of internal crisis, because of protests at ports um, and, uh, and delays to holding elections. So you don't really have a stable permanent government in, in, in Libya. So their production, yes, has risen, but you can't bank on it to stay at, at, at current levels. Mm -hmm. Um, you've also got uh, Iran is under sanctions. Venezuela is struggling to bring production back back up. Um, it has the world's largest conventional reserves, but it's heavy oil. It needs to be blended. It's not that easy to uh, to export without uh, without the additional blending. And of course, they too are under U.S. sanctions. Um, and then we have Iraq, which the IEA had singled out as one of the countries that would be that would be one of the largest contributors to new capacity in the future. But they they have the upstream capacity, but not the downstream and midstream because they uh, they have export bottlenecks. So we already have these shortfalls. So I think the market has moved from a um, uh, demand has recovered, um, maybe faster than people expected after the COVID uh, induced crash. So where do we see um, Iran potentially could? Uh, produce or export uh, another 1.5 million barrels a day if sanctions were lifted, but the nuclear talks don't seem to be going anywhere fast at the moment. Um, Jamie, anything to say about are we going to be looking at what happens to Iran or we have written about Iran's uh, the current state of Iran's energy industry, which of course has been starved of, of foreign investment for uh, while the sanctions have been in place. Yeah, I mean, as you say, um, Iran is its really the big unknown when it comes to the ability of OPEC Plus to bring new production online. Um, a lot of the talk on the amount of spare capacity that is held within the alliance, uh, there's, there's a disclaimer on that. It says excludes Iran simply because the capacity is there. It's not a geological issue. It's not because of production caps. It is because of U.S. sanctions, international sanctions. Um, 
and nobody knows how long that's going. those sanctions are going to remain in place. Uh, talks have been going on in Vienna now for, and frankly, it seems like forever. And the delegates on both sides, uh, it depends who you speak to and when you speak to them, they'll, at some point they'll say that talks are going excellently, that just around the corner from an agreement, other times it's, ooh, no, long way from any breakthrough. Um, at the moment, it's simply a waiting game. We're looking at Vienna, I think that when anything happens, no one would have forecast it, that it was a, that there was about to be a breakthrough. Um, as you say, they can probably bring on around 1.3, 1.5 million barrels a day once those sanctions are lifted, but that is the big question. Um, and the other issue as well is that it's not just how much they can ramp up production and therefore exports. They've got an awful lot of um, oil in floating storage at the moment. Um, I think that that will, pro that will be the first thing that will happen once um, sanctions are lifted, is that they will start to wind down that. Um, as much as anything, because they need the tankers that that crude and composite is stored in, um, they need to free that up simply to bring other production onto the market. And so where else do we see supply coming in, in the middle of this sort of uh, supply tightness? Um, obviously, prices at these levels encourage um, U.S. shale to grow. And I think uh, we did write something about, uh, you know, based on company results uh, that, that came out from Exxon and Chevron, the prospects for um, production increases from the Permian Basin, for example. Um, James, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, for sure, for sure, Case. Um, I think it's it's worth saying that even until now, the, the U.S. firms are very, very focused on capital, capital discipline and returns to shareholders, you know, even... For sure, Exxon, I mean, we wrote about in the latest issue that Exxon, they increased their Permian output by 25% last year, and they plan another 25% this year, and similar gains next year too. You know, they've got big plans to increase output, but the key thing they focus on their calls isn't isn't this, it's that we're, we're returning more to shareholders, you know, we're maintaining capital discipline, and the same for Chevron, um, Conoco had their results late last week as well. It's, there's a big focus on capital discipline. At the same time, within that, there's a bit of wiggle room. Um, earlier last year, you were getting more companies saying, no, we're not going to grow output. Now you're not getting that. You're getting them saying, we're only going to grow output if we can still return X amount to shareholders, if we can still do this. So I see, we see US shale output growing quite a lot this year, but we'll see by how much. Like like I say, of the companies to have announced results so far, Exxon's definitely been the bullish, most bullish. Also Chevron, which um, although their plans for this year are less um, for less strong growth than Exxon, they, they plan to hit um, 1 million barrels of oil equivalent a day of um, Permian output by uh, 2025. And they give the numbers in barrels of oil equivalent as a rule of thumb, about three quarters is uh, is liquids, so it's it's very strong growth plan. But to to give an idea of the um, the continu continued conservative outlook of some of these firms, um, Ryan Lance, the the Conoco uh, CEO, on his f firm's um, third quarter call on Thursday, he was really presenting it as a negative thing. The amount that the U.S. at the moment, he thinks the U.S. during calendar 2022 is going to grow up by 900,000 barrels a day. And he, he, the way he presented it, he thinks that's a scary prospect and it's too much and it's going to at attract a, a backlash from OPEC+. Plus. Uh, I don't know, uh, I, to me it didn't make too much sense, but this, this was the mentality, I mean, he was answering questions from U.S. stock analysts and they just want to see returns to shareholders. They don't want to see more output. And they're worried that if U.S. shale comes back too strongly, it'll unleash some some price war. Or, uh, that was the gist of what the analyst was saying, some price war and OPEC plus is going to flood the market or something. Didn't make too much sense, but but what was interesting was that this was the dominant thing, that we have to be conservative, we have to be careful, we shouldn't be increasing by this much. But that's exactly what happened. There was that price for um, when Russia didn't really think it was uh, it was a, an appropriate time at the height of the COVID mm -hmm. um, pandemic. They didn't think it was the right time to cut production. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, now with prices rising. But what I found interesting in, in reading our piece on, on the Exxon results is that their focus isn't really, um, it's on the Permian, 
it's Brazil and it's Guyana, which is the sort of the new frontier. No mention of the Middle East. I mean, even though Exxon does have um, mm -hmm. assets, except they are trying to extricate themselves from their... Uh, couple, from their of, couple of mentions of Qatar and the... Uh, Qatar, yes, LNG but, but awards, Iraq, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. That, but uh, Iraq, they're extricating themselves from. Yes, they do have interest in the East Med, but the fo I mean, they have said that their focus in the future is going to be the upstream focus will be on these new, uh, well, Brazil offshore, deep offshore, Guyana, and and the Permian. Yeah, I mean, being honest, I mean, we're, we're quite excited about Exxon in the East Med, and we've written some very good stuff on it. But Exxon haven't said much. You, you, you have to be honest. You know, they've said very, very little about this. You can tell from a corporate perspective, it's the Permian, it's Guyana. It's Brazil and it's pet chems as well. I mean, they've got the pet chems JV ethane cracker plant mm -hmm. with Sabic that's uh, just started up. So that's processing um, um, ethane from the Permian, from gas processing plants from the Permian and exporting that. So that, that's a big focus for them. But yeah, they haven't been saying much about the Middle East. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and it's interesting just kind of circling back to the Qatar issue as well with the US. A lot of the investment there has been... Uh, you know, has, has resulted in increased gas production and a lot of investment going into LNG export facilities as well. Um, so, yeah, I th I th you wrote something last week about uh, a lot, you know, US LNG exports increasing significantly. Mm. Um, and w I also had a quick look at some of the Kepler data, and that mm. showed um, yeah, record levels of US LNG going into the UK last month. And there was also an IEA report about the state of the gas market. And I think there are there is an expectation that this downturn in price from 2020 and 2021 and decline in investment will actually affect new greenfield projects, some of which may not go, go ahead. Um, and, uh, you know, but even though there is going to be more demand for for gas, particularly LNG in the, in the future. Mm. Um, so, yeah, definitely. I think a lot of, you know, the aside from Qatar, a lot of the big plants on the on the drawing board are in the US and, and they really see this as their big opportunity to mm -hmm. sign up term customers in Europe, you know, <laughs> over the next couple of months. We'll see if they succeed. I mean, there was a, I think a lot of US LNG plant proposers have, have got a shock. Um, was it last year or the year before that France's, um, France's Angie basically cancelled the MOU to purchase US LNG because there wasn't the... Um, upstream controls in place on uh, methane emissions and the environmental side of things. And I think US producers have realized that they have to get their acting gear on this sort of thing. I mean, it's a bit more complex for US LNG exporters in that the model that they have there is that generally the companies building the LNG plant aren't the companies that produce the gas. So it's more complex to get um, um, full stream control of, um, of methane emissions. But if you read what the representatives from the sector are saying now in the US, they realize that they've got to be able to market a product. You know, if they're marketing in Europe, they have to be able to market a product where they can account for the the methane and other emissions and the carbon content of the LNG. It's it's a huge thing with Qatar as well, with their big expansion trains on, they're making it very clear that from from the design stage they were going on in with carbon capture. Um, they, they see as a major competitive advantage of them is the relatively low carbon intensity of the LNG that they're selling. And that is going to be an increasingly important um, marketing issue going forward. And of course, Qatar is in a, in a better position than, than other LNG producers in that its cost is very, very yeah. low. You know, they've got the cheap feedstock and that's one of the reasons why I suppose petrochemicals mm -hmm. does quite well I think we had the piece on on Sabic um, in our in our last edition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah absolutely the, um, they've had some tough times for pet chems in the Gulf over the last couple of years but since the second half of 2020 um, th there's been just a massive turnaround uh, we're starting to see the profit margins get um, condensed a little bit now revenues are still climbing significantly but they're getting hurt a bit with the high feedstock costs like everybody else. Um, so they're still bullish as to, what, as to the outlook for 2022, but we probably won't quite see the kind of multi-year, multi-decade even um, profit margins that we saw in 20, the second half of 2020 and in 2021. Okay, I think um, we're going to end it now. And if you want any further information, um, read our reports in full, you can find them on mies.com. 
uh, plus subscription information. And um, we look forward to seeing you or yeah, we look forward to, <laughs> to joining us uh, in our next podcast where we will have um, some of our other uh, reporters who, um, who cover uh, energy and uh, other aspects of uh, the economy. <laughs> in the MENA region, um, we have um, experts on Iraq, Iran, and uh, North Africa, who and the East Med, of course, um, joining us, and guest speakers in, in the future. So stay tuned. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Bye.